from the Catholic underground. Today on the show, Saints Peter and Paul, new tech in the medical and business world, faith-based video, the funeral biz again, our picks of the week, and so much more. The Catholic Underground, well, it starts right now. Put your hand on the YouTube. It's time for the Catholic Underground, your <laughs> weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 268. I'm Father Chris Decker, a priest of the Diocese of Baton Rouge. If you're listening live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv. And even though we're having chat room issues, you can still watch us live. So uh, we've got uh, a full panel this week, uh, as as you might know. Joining me, we got Father Ryan Humphreys. He's the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. Hello, Father. Hello, world. Also, Kathleen Lee. She's the incoming campus minister, now now full-on campus minister at St. Michael the Archangel High School in Baton Rouge. She is our fully licensed faith ninja. Hello, Kathleen. Well, hi. <laughs> and... <laughs> Jeff Blackwell is the technical director of the CU. He is the commandant of the Jeff Star One Near Earth Orbit Satellite. Hello, Jeff. Love that satellite. Yes, indeed. Don't we all? And also, yeah, we've got uh, Ed Ball, who is uh, the silent witness uh, in the video room. So I hate to Ed. And uh, and we've got you, of course. You're here. You're you're watching us on um, on television. You're watching us on YouTube. You're listening to us on the radio. You're listening to us via podcast. We're happy that you're here because you're an integral part of our show. And actually, you wouldn't be here if not for the work of two very important men who uh, actually happened to fall on the Sunday this week, Saints Peter and Paul. Father Ryan, uh, this is actually a really cool feast day, isn't it? Oh, it's one of my very favorite. It's, it's such a great feast because you have these two totally different people who are coming at everything from totally opposite directions, and yet God is using them to do amazing things. And it's one of those those wake-up moments for me where you say, I don't have to be like this other person or in these circumstances, yeah. but that God has given me some specific call, and all I've got to do is answer it. It's a really great feast. That's right. And uh, I'm always taken aback on the Feast of St. Peter and Paul because uh, the the just the difference in personalities really strike me. I mean, uh, you know, you have Father Ryan and I who are very different personalities, and yet we are, we are part of the same apostolate, and we do some of the same work. I think Peter and Paul couldn't have been more different in in their approach, and the Lord used that in a very real way because, of course, Peter preached primarily to the Jewish people, uh, his own his own people there, and Paul, once his conversion happened and and he moved away from um, essentially, if you want, Father, from the life of the Pharisee into the life of being a, a Christian uh, apostle, uh, he began to evangelize the Gentiles, and he spoke right, to and- them in a completely different way that they needed to hear. And I kind of love the fact that Paul was perfectly suited to be the man for the Jews. He's educated. He's a Jew. He's sharp. He's got all the studies. And so God says, okay, you go work with the Gentiles. And then there's Peter who sells fish to all the Gentiles who's told, no, no, you just focus on the Jews. It's outstanding. I love it. Just kind of stick where you are. Uh, Do do your thing. And, of course, the fact that that Peter, uh, my homily this weekend was about uh, how whenever— we see the bishop in the Walmart, or we see a priest at uh, at the supermarket. We're kind of taken aback and saying, "Oh, there's no way that that I could be who they are in the sanctuary." But when we look at Peter and Paul, we see two very, very human people, extremely human, in fact. Kathleen, do you see the humanness of of Saint Peter and Saint Paul? Well, absolutely, and I like the the you know the two different approaches because they're I'm I'm always you know you talk about people who um, who church shop. Yeah, and I'm like, well, you know, it's the same thing. But I, I love being priests with all kinds of different. I mean, friends with all kinds of different priests. Yeah, and you see that that multiplicity. Yeah, and you see our humanity really Absolutely. well too. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and Peter being a fisherman, uh, who was kind of an everyday guy. Paul coming from the Pharisaic class, um, kind of um, uh, aristocracy, if you will, in the religious sense, and yet doing wonderful and beautiful things. And uh, Jeff, both of them going to their death in martyrdom for the faith. And that's the, uh, the, the, the price of, of, of serving Christ, uh, mm-hmm. unfortunately. And um, there is something coming up later in the show. I'm just going to tease that a little okay. bit about where the uh, apostles mm-hmm. are believed to have uh, died or yeah. met, met their end. Uh, but w- in, in, uh, in our church this morning, um, uh, Father read from the, uh, the vigil 
uh, the gospel Readings, from the vigil, uh -huh. uh, and uh, and then the, it, it just amazes me, and I and I can't even imagine being in those days. But uh, but he he read the uh, it was again. Now this is after Jesus had um, already arisen. He had, he had and, risen. And, he he had uh, mm -hmm. yeah. He was back here, and he's asking Peter again. You know, hey, do you love me? Well, mm -hmm. you know, I love you. So uh, it was just um, I, it was just stunning to me. It was. It, it, you know, being there in church and, and, and taking that step back in time yeah. as to how it must have been, and then, of course, uh, the way their lives ended. One of the things that, that really uh, hits me about, about Peter specifically is we know that he was a fisherman and that he was a guy who didn't really have much of a filter. Peter was also a sinner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, his sin is, is uh, splayed there right out for everybody to see. At the time yeah. when Jesus needed friends the most, Peter didn't know him all of a sudden. Hmm. And and at that that account after breakfast on the beach where where uh, the Lord invites him back one time for each of the times that he turned away from the Lord yes yeah and and just the the fact that the Lord wishes to work with us in the same way he yes. he wants to call us disciples the same way he called Peter and Paul and so I find it um, very easy to identify with them but then further Father to to carry it a little bit more. Is they don't. I, I'm just not called to be like them in my humanity. I'm called to be holy, like they tried to be. Right, and and, and to be holy even beyond as they tried to be, because yeah. we have them as an example. Correct. You know, and so we can't simply say, "Well, I'll just do. I'll act as if we don't." You know, I mean, we have to be willing to accept that there's all these different kinds of saints, but that God has made me specifically. Yeah. Uh, and all those people are examples for me, and so I've got to learn and move even further. If I'm not standing on the shoulders of these great people, then I'm not really honoring what the church has, has created for me this moment in history. That's right. Now think about that, Jeff. Put that in your prayer life <laughs> and mm -hmm. pray on it. The fact that you're not called to be <laughs> just, just like Peter and Paul, you're called to surpass them in holiness. That's, that's enough to make anybody go cross-eyed. In Washington Parish, we'd call that heavy duty. That's right, just like the watermelons. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, so Father Ryan and I actually were, uh, we found ourselves in a pallium mass in 2007. And you might be asking yourself, Jeff, what's a pallium? I was going to ask you, what's a pallium? Yeah, a pallium is the, the piece of white wool that an archbishop or the pope wears. Have you ever noticed that? It looks like they're wearing a big kind of, a, it looks kind of like a big horse collar made out of wool. You ever, have you ever noticed it? I have not no. noticed that, no. Now you have something to look for. I will. Kathleen knows what, what, what the pallium is, because our own Archbishop in New Orleans, Archbishop Amon, wears one. It's this, it's this kind of strip of cloth. It's a symbol of their authority uh, as a metropolitan bishop, and it is also their connection to Peter. It's their connection with is the Pope. Is that so right? The Pope, even though the Pope is not an archbishop, he is, he is the bishop, if you will, and so he wears a pallium, and then all of the other archbishops wear a pallium as a symbol of their unity with him. Did I explain oh. that right, Father? Yes, you did. Very good. That it, thank you. Oh, yes, and now that I'm seeing it, <laughs> yeah. I know. In your it. head, you've Googled mm -hmm. it. And, yeah, I have. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Father Ryan and I actually happened to be in Rome right after my ordination. We were kind of taking the thank you tour, you know, and, uh, and we found ourselves at a pallium mass. It was one of the coolest experiences of my life because we, we knew that it was going to be the Feast of Saints Peter and, Peter and Paul, and we saw Pallium, but it didn't occur to us that, 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 that was, yeah, there, that would be, there would be the Pope. And, and generally, anytime there's a public mass, there's cardinals around. But all these archbishops, including Archbishop Tom Collins. Right. Oh, thank you. It's a real guy, um, Toronto. Now Cardinal Collins. <laughs> now Cardinal Tom. Nice. Tom Cardinal Collins. That's right. I was looking for Bishop Jose Cuervo. We couldn't find him. No, but, um, no. Unavailable for the, comment. <laughs> But, but so you have all these men coming down and then they're kind of being put on the spot and there's the Pope and this was Pope Benedict is looking at him and going, we're about to, to lay upon you this authority, but also the yoke of Christ. And you have a unique call now to lead not just a handful of people, but you got to think of an archdiocese with a million souls yeah. or five million souls, as in the case of places like LA and New York. Wow. That's an unbelievably heavy burden. You know, I mean, it's scary enough for me as a priest to have five or 600 families. But imagine millions of people, and, and that that's the yoke of Christ on the on the Archbishop there, and those five crosses for the five wounds aren't by accident. That's right, uh, and that's the, the the neat thing about the pallia is that they they actually are um, they're they're a very rich symbol. They're a symbol of of authority certainly, but also of willingness to well to be a martyr if need be, 
And that is one of those things that just kind of does make, it makes me go, oh my, this is real stuff. This isn't just playing at church. This mm-hmm. is, this is actual, this is, this is us. I actually, for those of watching on the, on the video feed, I have a very low res picture of, of a pallium, um, which as you can see, it's kind of a banded uh, cloth. And uh, in fact, I think we can go to that. It's up on, uh, up on three. Um, it, it's a, it's a banded cloth and, uh, with the, the crosses there, and then there are pins that go in those crosses that are that are usually shaped like nails. Right. So there you go. Wow. It's interesting. Pope Benedict, when he was uh, first made pope, decided to use an, a different version of the pallium that that was an older one. That instead of having the 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 kind of the yoke and then come down the center, he had it hang off slightly to the side. And you know, <clears throat> after about two or three years of that, he himself said the symbol is not made richer by this, that the, the really the, the yoke is the symbol that matters. And he did away with this thing and said, let's go back to the, the, the same one, the simpler one. And in fact, Pope Francis this year did make a lot of waves because it wasn't that big of a deal, went from uh, red crosses that had been installed by Benedict back to the black crosses that all the archbishop wear, all the archbishops wear. But it's, it's really interesting because the symbol is so evocative it's not necessary to to twerk it or to not to twerk mm-hmm. it to tweak it. Um, it's never necessary to twerk it, uh, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it wasn't necessary to tweak in any way, shape, or form. It's just such a perfect symbol of that yoke, and at the same time, the nails and the crosses and all of those things. That's right. And for those watching the video feed, uh, we have uh, the old pallium that Francis is wearing, the one with the red crosses, uh, where he's uh, he's actually giving the pallia to uh, to one of the uh, archbishops there. So really, really rich symbolism that, that Peter's ministry, and Paul's for that matter, still mm-hmm. continues today. And that in a real way, uh, Peter, um, the, the successor of Peter, Pope Francis, is, he's in Rome uh, primarily, and, and he is preaching to all the pilgrims from Rome. And in a sense, would you say, Father, that all of the archbishops are kind of like Paul? They're the ones who were sent out as missionaries into the different areas of the world? That's exactly what they are. They're, 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 they're designed to be, they're not called as, as they're not called first, but they are called later and they're called in a more profound way. And in a certain sense, I, I kind of like one of the things I like is when Pope John Paul was there, when, it, when a man was selected to be the, a bishop, the nuncio would call and say, the Pope would like you to consider being a bishop. And he would say yes or no. Benedict, the guy would call and say, Benedict has selected you to be a bishop. Do you have some grave reason you can't do it? With Francis is, uh, you've been selected as a bishop. You can pick up your stuff and move to Milwaukee next week. Uh, you know, there's not a question. It's, it's very Pauline because, of course, Peter was said, you know, come follow after me. Paul was yeah. knocked down and struck blind. Mm. You know, so you, you have different kinds of calls from the Lord sometimes. And I often feel like I was a more Pauline call because my middle name is Paul. And, of course, I was slapped on the side of the head and struck blind until I was able to you know, move forward. So what are you going to do? That's right. And, and mine was very much kind of a Petrine call because I, I was kind of following along with the Lord, you know, and uh, as, a, as a young person. And then uh, he said, uh, let's go fish. And yeah. I said, okay, you know, not to put too fine a point on it. And then for those watching our video feed again, I'm giving you every reason if you're listening on the radio to, to turn on CatholicUnderground.tv uh, because I have a, a little close-up picture of, uh, of the pallium with the red crosses. Ah. So you can kind of see go. it uh, up close, yeah, without the pins in it. So that's uh, that's kind of cool. But also, are you aware, Jeff, that there are different kinds of bishops? Let me think about that. I uh, I guess I never really have thought about it other than bishop and archbishop. But Okay, uh, well, yeah, there you go. Uh, that's right. And now, do you know the difference? Well, I, the way I look at it is the, the uh, and I'm just basing it on here in Louisiana. No, yep. The, the Archdiocese of New Orleans mm-hmm. has an archbishop. Uh-huh. And, um, it's kind of like which came uh, first, the archbishop or the archdiocese, huh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Right. But no, really to answer your question, no, I didn't know that. Uh, I didn't know there were. Yeah, and, and uh, basically, Father, uh, there, are, there are bishops and then there are archbishops, and the archbishops are the ones who are essentially in charge of all of the other bishops in their territory, right? Well, give or take. You have, you have bishops and you have archbishops, and that's just a, a function of whether the diocese they're in is a small or a large diocese. Yeah. Most archdioceses yeah. are also metropolitan sees, yeah. which means that the archbishop is also the metropolitan, which just means that he has a kind of, it's a loose sense of not authority, but oversight responsibility. Yeah. So exactly. if if I'm a bishop in, in Louisiana, which we're all going to pray never happens, <laughs> um, and and I make a decision that gets some people upset. Maybe I say we've got to close a parish, or maybe I decide to buy a bazooka on the parish dime. Um, 
Which he won't. The archbishop would would theoretically come up or call me and say, um, you know, why did you do this? It's it's causing you some friction. It's causing problems. Um, you know, have you taken care of it? Have you dealt with this drama? And then the nuncio, he might call the nuncio, which is the Pope's legate, and say, look, I talked to him, and this is the story. Uh, you know, so it's not like he could drive up here and say, you get your act together. That that wouldn't be appropriate. But he is kind of vaguely responsible, the same way that a dean is vaguely responsible. The dean's not really in charge of the priests, but he has a certain kind of oversight authority. That's right. So, you know, it's, exactly. it's, it's informal. Now, as you know, our, our chat room is kind of on the blink, uh, but we are receiving tweets and Facebook messages and even oh. text messages. And so I have to read this from uh, from uh, an unnamed priest who says, uh, this is an historic moment in Catholic broadcasting. I would be willing to bet this is the first time the word twerk has ever been spoken on Catholic <laughs> radio. <laughs> and why shouldn't it be spoken by Father Ryan, you know? That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, uh, well, from that to this. Oh. What's well, the matter? Another wheel coming off? You're listening to the Catholic <laughs> Underground we're online at catholicunderground.tv. I'm Father Chris Decker. We've got Father Ryan Humphreys joining us via Skype. Jeff Blackwell in the audio cave. Kathleen Lee and Ed Ball, who is providing our video service uh, at catholicunderground.tv. Our picks of the week are coming up a little bit later. But first, there has been a, a little bit of a breakthrough from the medical technology desk at the CU, which is staffed by Father Ryan. Brazil is releasing, get this, especially if you're in Louisiana or the South, mutated mosquitoes. To fight from, I can't even pronounce this fever. Dengue. Oh, okay. There it is. So, Just Father think Daniel Ochum. What is Dengue. this? What is this fever? And why do I need a mutated mosquito to fight it? Well, <laughs> I got a fever. Um, <laughs> it, it has nothing to do with cowbell. No, it is. No. In fact, uh, it, uh, dengue fever is something like a, a slightly less horrific version of malaria. Oh, uh, wow. It causes in in tropical climates, mosquitoes carry all kinds of viruses, bacteria, mm -hmm. and this is one of those fevers that can be treated. But if you if you just kind of try to wait it out, it gets closer and closer to yellow fever, and in fact, the death rate is fairly high among the very poor. And so the idea is. Um, when we treat a lot of diseases is that we want to we want to make a cell, we want to convince a cell or trick a cell into killing other viruses or other cells, just like a cancer. Cancer medication mostly nowadays is all about mutating certain cells to convince the cancer to stop spreading. Well, we've decided to mutate mosquitoes now in something out of a Jeff Goldblum movie from the yeah. 70s. Um, we we basically mutate mosquitoes so that when they bite people, they deliver something that is, uh, rather the mosquitoes are, are more likely to kill off the other kinds of mosquitoes that cause these diseases. Because they got built-in syringes. That's right. <laughs> and so um, one of the things we have to realize is this, this is not just dengue. It's not just just about dengue. It's about all of these uh, these tropical diseases, especially malaria. Most people don't realize that malaria is the single number one killer in the history of the world. More people have died by malaria than anything else ever. The only thing that's coming close, I mean, barely close, is abortion. Yeah. And so malaria is a giant big deal. And so if we can find a way to make some mosquito, mutated or otherwise, that will get in there and, and reduce the spread of malaria, this is a giant big deal. And so right now we're testing it on dengue. Who knows what happens next, but it's one of those really important things to know for all informed Catholics. It's not yeah. necessarily about the church, but it's a big deal. We all need to know about it. And and this is actually a, a probably a good uh, bioethical um, social justice thing to do, uh, where you can actually use a, a creature uh, in a way that is that is beneficial to uh, to humanity. Kathleen, you actually have been involved in a lot of mission work, and uh, yeah. you, you've certainly worked with the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you where do you stand on this? Because I mean, anytime you're manipulating the genetic structure of something, you're thinking, oh, we might be playing with fire here. Yeah, I think it's a in you know listening to it, it sounds like a good idea. I'd like to know what you know what the future effects will be on human beings and yeah. and on the ecosystem, things like that. Um, you know. I just always get a little nervous when when you start talking about messing with. Well, when you inject humanity into yeah. into the the course of things and saying, well, we we will mm -hmm. we will use um, this mosquito and we will engineer it in such a way. Uh, I suppose maybe the larger question is when 
when do we cease to cooperate with God yeah. and the original design of said mosquito? Right. And uh, when do we begin to start to play God? True. Know? I mean, it sounds great. And, yeah. and, you know, you're talking about people who are... Saving lives. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and who wouldn't have any access to medical coverage. Exactly. Uh, of, of any kind. So yeah. if you can do this, it sounds like you're doing this, you know, naturally, if you can, for lack of a better word, but if you're, you know, have this natural um, fight against mm-hmm. this disease. Yeah. But I just, I just wonder what the long-term effects are going to be. Because we all know what messing with the ecosystem can be. Yeah. You know, especially here in Louisiana with our little nutria rat friends with the nutria with kudzu there mm-hmm. are all sorts of things yeah. that have altered our ecosystem yeah, yeah. oh yeah uh, well you know the and the, the thing too that I, I always think about when this is is there is something that it has has been used that dramatically reduced the number of cases of malaria around the world mm-hmm. and that something is dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethylene ddt um, which is ddt which mm-hmm. is which was vilified for no good reason the scientific yep. community um, has yet to prove that DDT does anything other than kill mosquitoes in mm. vast quantities. People can literally pick up and eat spoonfuls of the stuff. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, you can, you, can, you can pick it up and eat spoonful of it, and it has no adverse effects. It does on certain species of, like, certain kinds of cats, certain kinds of, of snakes. Mm-hmm. But DDT was vilified um, for, for political reasons that had to do with communism, that had to do with political stuff in the United States. But it worked. And the tragedy is that people are dying in dramatic quantities around the world and we're having to resort to mutating mosquitoes when there is a product that works. But it's just one of those things. Politics are politics. The world has always been as it is. And it's not like we should pretend that we're different. But it's just one of those things that kind of gets my goat, you know, when there's something that works, but we've got to resort to some kind of absurd logical reach mm-hmm. to... Yeah because of politics it just just makes me nuts I, and i wasn't aware of that uh, with, with ddt um yeah i, I gotta say the, the whole mutated mosquito thing really intrigues me because uh, i i find it uh, rather neat that we can just send an organism that already has a built-in needle <laughs> yeah. you know to deliver something that would be other than than malaria causing uh but it is it's a reach it is a bit of a reach i think uh, you know and, and again just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should and just because this could be mutually beneficial to society doesn't mean that there aren't other options that that don't involve us having to kind of get involved on that genetic level, you yeah. know. Um, so uh, there it is. Uh, from physical health to business health, Google has launched a new platform to attempt to connect businesses with customers. And I noticed Father Ryan on uh, the Catholic Radio uh, map page on Google that all of a sudden there's this new my business thing, but but I haven't looked into it yet. Well, we've talked before about some efforts that Google has made to produce a competitor to Facebook. Yeah. And they've just never been able to get a real working social media platform going. And we know Google Plus, it's, 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 it's okay. There. We've tried it. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a very niche thing. Certain people are just using the mess out of it. Most people just aren't really caring. But the popularity of Android and Gmail means that whether or not Google can compete with Facebook directly, they've got it in. I mean, people mm-hmm. are using their product. Yeah. And so, um, and so what, what Google is doing is they're starting to, to segment and granularate, that's not a word, uh, in a granular way, uh, try to pull out those parts of their products that really work and then integrate them into other products. So rather than try to compete with Facebook, they're pulling my business out. And they're going to introduce this entirely new way of thinking about business, which is going to, I think, work very well because it's not trying to overdo. Google tends to be really good at hitting things on the head. And so, again, like before, what's interesting here is not just this product. What's interesting, though, is a much bigger kind of mindset that's entering into Google and entering into Apple that's causing them to say, let's think in a much bigger way. Let's think outside of the box, to use that term. Um, let's go back to the drawing board. And even if we love something, we've got to be willing to dump it in, yeah. play in, in, in favor of that which really works. And I think this is actually a, a good thing for Catholics to look at because there's some stuff we really like, yeah. but it's not working and it hasn't worked in years. And we've tried these big, gigantic things, but why don't we kind of focus and see how that works out? And so it's an interesting thing, and it's an interesting paradigm for us to consider. Yeah, you know that uh, that not just Google, but other corporations kind of cannibalize their own content, and they rework it. And uh, this type of mutation is okay, 
because this can can hopefully say, well, what what is working and how can we reach the the most uh, of whomever we're trying to reach, you know? Uh, so I, I think this could be very good. Um, I, I wonder, as you say, Father, with, with us uh, in the church, if there couldn't be some applications here to say, well, maybe this in my parish is working, this isn't working. Uh, is there a way that I can kind of mesh what did work with uh, something else that I'm trying to do? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. So um, I think I think the best way to, to not geek out completely about this, Jeff, is to have a little bit of fun. Uh, if I can. Uh, the, so, well, wait a minute. This mutation you were talking about, yeah. we're off of mosquitoes now, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm told. So I'm told. <laughs> okay. uh, although, if you if you have ever seen this independent band, you will wonder if if there isn't some sort of a mutation uh, taking place in the human genome. Because this the band is named OK Go. Okay. And they, Go. they've made their name. Uh, they've kind of become, come into themselves through these quirky, viral music videos on YouTube and um, their their new video is a trove of optical illusions and they're they're really awesome in the sense that they they play to the camera they oh, really because yeah. a lot of music videos I mean I grew up in the 80s and um, there was a time kids whenever uh, music television was actually television that had music videos on it mm-hmm. in fact it killed a radio star I know Kathleen what, what are you gonna say Yes. I forgot, Ka- Kathleen. You grew up during the time of music television. I did, yeah. although I didn't have cable. I had to go to my friend's house to watch. That's right. You just had the Fox. We, had, we didn't have DVR either or YouTube, so we had to wait until the video came on. Yeah, imagine that. You know how many other videos I watch waiting for Backstreet Boys to come? <laughs> oh, quit playing games with my struggle. heart, Kathleen. Uh, and so, and so, uh, and so, yeah. They they actually are playing to the camera. They they know that you're watching. Whereas a music video in days of yore just kind of let you watch from the third party that, you know, that something's going on. Yeah. But OK Go, uh, they've used things like treadmills, haven't they? Yeah, OK Go, yeah. the name of the band. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, someone had sent me um, a link to a YouTube video a couple of years ago. And uh, they, they uh, started off with their first video, which was on treadmills. And uh, that was here. Here it goes again. Yeah. Uh, then they did. This is the one that I, I saw and I watched over and over again. They did the really cool Rube Goldberg machine for this two shall pass is the name of that video. This two shall pass. And what what amazes me is that they want to do this all in one take. And yeah. it, it, it is possible. But they have to. it was like, uh, in fact, on their latest video. Uh, which we'll have a link for in the show notes at catholicunderground.com. Yeah. Uh, check it out because uh, the, the music's okay. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't think it's hit radio stuff, uh, but it's um, you know it's innocent enough. It's fun, but the uh, the videos are just so well done and produced, and they go to a lot. There's a lot of pre-production and work that goes into uh, making these things. So um, really, what makes the uh, the the band so great, as we've talked about before is they uh, really want to do well what they do well, and OK Go does quirky and unexpected very well. Uh, you'll love it. It's, uh, it's entertainment. Uh, bring, the, bring the kids and neighbors. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's fun to watch. Um, but it's the people behind the scenes that really make this happen. One take, the camera is moving all over the place. These guys are running from these little sets all around this huge studio. It's kind of like an extended video selfie. Oh, gosh, is it? But it, it is extremely well done. And uh, the latest video is called The Writings on the Wall. Uh, and again, you can check it out in our show notes. Uh, you'll enjoy it. Uh, and uh, even Grandma will like it, too. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen, you know about OK Go, huh? I do. I do. I'm hip with the cool kids. <laughs> I To me, watching, because uh, I, I use the treadmill pretty re- regularly. Mm-hmm. And... Um, the things that this band is doing with the treadmill, you know, they're kind of hopping on and hopping off and then hopping onto each other's treadmills yeah. and kind of synchronized treadmilling. I, I can barely just walk on the thing, <laughs> right? you know, and I know what happens like if my shoe comes untied and, and I have to, you know, hop to the side of the treadmill, just trying yeah. to get back on is, is, is not easy. And so they do, they have these really cool uh, music videos and you say the music's pretty catchy too. Um, some other music that's catchy is this music. If you can imagine, we are the Catholic Underground, and we are coming to you live. I am Father Chris Decker, 
joined on Skype by Father Ryan Humphreys. We've got Kathleen Lee sitting over there to my left, which is your right. Jeff Blackwell, who sits across from me in what looks to be a fishbowl if you're watching us uh, on, <laughs> on the video feed. And Ed Ball, our picks of the week, of course, are coming up in a little bit. But uh, the Catholic Underground Cavalcade moves on. A Hollywood faith-based film summit shows that spiritual content is in high demand, Kathleen. And there, there are a lot, a lot of spirituality-based uh, films that are out right now. Well, yeah, and we've discussed uh, the five big faith-based movies uh, slated for 2014, like Noah. Noah. God is not dead. Um, I think they had Heaven is for Real. Heaven is for Real. That might have been a couple years old. but and then Yeah, and then there have been several others as well. But there are several others, yes. But what we didn't tell you Son is of that, God. Oh, that was, that was the one I was looking one. for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Um, what we didn't tell you is that those movies we highlighted, and even some more, mm-hmm. were being discussed last year at a major Hollywood summit meeting about family and faith entertainment. So before they came to be... They were mm-hmm. being discussed uh, at a Hollywood summit. Yeah, so like not at not at like a Catholic conference at like mm-hmm. big secular, wigs, actual yeah. money changing hands kind of mm-hmm. summit. Yeah, yeah, and and there actually is a really high demand for these kind of movies in the United States. So why why are they why the summit? What were they doing? Well, what Hollywood is doing is looking at what works and what doesn't, which they should because mm-hmm. it's yeah. media. Who's what are they? You know what's selling and what is not mm-hmm. selling. Um, and certainly we know that cheese does not sell. No. Not in the movies. Not, you know and you know about my Catholic's default to cheese uh, concept. We, we tend to do that. But I'm, I'm seeing through some of the, these uh, off-Hollywood movies that sometimes Christianity defaults to cheese. Oh, my gosh. And yes. yeah, some of it's mm. difficult to watch. Cheese does not belong in the movie theater unless it's a topping on your popcorn. Ah. Yum. Or nachos. Yeah. That's a, so there you good. go, Kathleen. That's your quotable yeah. for the week. I like that. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> so we know that movies like Left Behind, Fireproof, yeah. oh, good yeah. movies. Yeah. I'm um, gonna get some some crowds, but uh, they they Yo. probably aren't gonna be bought on DVD and Blu-ray. Um, Sorry. they'll they'll fizzle pretty pretty quickly once the word gets out. Or about you'll have a kind of a Bible study kind of thing where a, a parish or a, a church will. We'll watch it and then mm-hmm. glean some of the stuff from it. Yeah, um, and we saw how badly Noah, uh, how badly Noah did at the box office, and we connected that with its totally unfaithful representation yeah. of the Bible story. Yeah, uh, as mm-hmm. as I've heard, you know, kind of like the Hobbit films. If you go and suspend everything that you know about the Hobbit, they're pretty good films. If you go and you suspend everything you know about Scripture, Noah, from what <laughs> I understand, was a pretty good film. Yeah. But I don't know, Father. Did you see Noah? That's a negative Ghost Rider. <laughs> the pattern was full. <laughs> I don't. I don't suspend my belief in Jesus Christ for the purpose of movie films. Ah, that's another quotable. There we just full deal of with all that. Wow. Usually, it's me who's racked oh. up the most quotables Alex by this Bentley. time. Hey. Show. Yeah. Zinger. So yeah. Uh, so there's a happy medium here, right? Yeah. We we. It seems like this happy medium is a generally faithful um, presentation of the stories and values of faith. Sure. Uh, made in a way that genuinely entertains without the use of things like sex, violence, language. All the things that most people go to the movies to see these right. days. Right. All so, those sensational things. So so like a, a good faith-based movie yeah. would be one that doesn't resort to all that stuff to tell the story, but that also can be close to what we kind of are hardwired to believe. Right. I find that sometimes these films, Father, don't go very far because we go in with a set value system. Even if we don't say, oh, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not practicing anymore, we go in with a value system. Part of it is, is the natural law, I think, and part of it is, is certainly uh, what we, we, we have received, uh, because many of us have been churched in some way. Well, and, of course, and, and we're all built to, to learn in all sorts of different ways, and right. fiction is one of the best ways for us to learn. I mean, we, we go back to Shakespeare. We go back to any number of things. Stories are how we learn our basic morals as children. That's right. You know, and so, so it's not to say that every movie needs to have, needs to come from the scripture or even needs to have overt religious details. Yeah. But, but you know, there's a certain sense of, of a morality of a right and a wrong and a triumph of good over evil. These things are built into us, and we all long to see them expressed and lived out. Yeah, and, and that's, I think... When we go in, that's what we're looking for. We're saying, yeah. are, are the values that, that are perhaps buried deep within me, 
uh, being presented to me in a way that I can then connect with them again. Because that's what, like, yeah. I think of Aesop's fables, right? Those are those are stories that are completely disconnected from reality and that they're, they're fairy tales about animals that talk. And uh, But at the end, there is a, a moral that we do kind of take and extract out of that fantasy world and we then make it a part of, of how we live our lives. And so Hollywood is, is looking at this. Now, Father, I remember a time whenever, of course, I say I remember a time. I, I, was, I was not <laughs> quite on earth yet. Uh, but there was a time that every movie that you watched almost always had a faithful priest in it and usually a nun. Mm-hmm. And, and those were the, the, the land of the 50s. Uh, um, mm-hmm. uh, Jeff, you, you might vaguely remember some of those days where you had the Bells of St. Mary's. You had uh, uh, things like Going My Way, mm-hmm. um, The Shoes of the Fisherman. Right. Uh, this is a time when Hollywood, for some reason, held up faith life as important. Yeah. Even even the uh, like the, the gangster, not, I don't know what mean gangster, but like gang movies. Yeah. Um, uh, Bowery Boys uh, was one, but um, uh, Boys Town. Yeah. Had uh, a good old faithful priest in That's it. That's true. Know, so, um, right. But oh man, today, and I don't always look for symbolism in movies either. That's that's a uh, that's kind of a. I'll give you a good example, like uh, E.T., um, where E.T. dies. Now, uh-huh. even though this is a Spielberg movie, uh huh, and he's Jewish, uh-huh. uh huh, but uh, where E.T. dies, he rises from the dead. Yep. And then, and the, the chase scene, you know, he's he's uh, cloaked in this white sheet, uh, you know, with his hands held wide open. Uh, looking out the back of this van, and 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 people are talking about, oh, the symbolism of that of such Christianity wasn't that wonderful? I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, I'd rather just you know, just lay it on the line. Let's uh, tell it like it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, uh, and of course, I, when I go to a film, I expect symbolism. I'm looking for it. Oh, are you? Okay. Yeah, well, I'm I'm hardwired for that sort of. Thing. Maybe it's the artist in me, but I think maybe it's the Catholic in me too. Is that we as Catholics see just about everything through the lens of symbol, through through a veil, if you will. Yeah. Even if that veil is as thin as cheesecloth, we still, uh, you know, uh, I, I've often been told by, there was, there was a wise priest who said, my job is to peel back the veil mm. during the Mass and allow you to see a glimmer of the reality of, of what we're doing here and, mm. and who we're about and who we're with in this moment. And then to kind of place the veil back and then you mm. go back to, to your life being lived and you you take some of what you've experienced there, and so I a good movie for me does that. It kind of peels back a veil, you know. Good symbol, good use of symbol. So I wonder, can we do films? Can we make films in a way that works in the same way that for whatever reason it worked in the fifties? I don't know, Father. What do you think? Well, you know, I mean, I'm thinking about what works on TV now. You you've got Game of Thrones, Mad Men, Walking Dead, Breaking Bad. And I think more and more we're being trained to need this kind of filth. And, and we experience that in our lives. When we, when we love God, there's a certain sense of freedom from ourselves. But when we, we attach ourselves to sin, there's a, a greater dependency upon sin to make, it, to make ourselves go. Yeah. Um, but I think studios like Pixar, yeah. films like Frozen, yeah. um, show that there's plenty of room to turn it around. And, mm-hmm. of course, our very human nature is oriented toward God. And so, I mean, it's... Yeah. it's unquestionable it can be turned around the film industry itself though the the industry as it becomes more and more buried in its own baggage yeah that becomes its own question but i do think that people within that industry and the democratization of creation of films that make that's made possible by the inexpensive and you know software and things like that it may be that 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 the individual and the uh the independent saves the film industry but i don't know i think it's possible to be sure that's right and there are some independent folks on youtube that uh, that show you how to make movies and stuff stuff like that they're creating content that there's not a trace of cheese in it and it's absolutely amazing and i wonder if it's not some of these uh 20 somethings and 30 somethings who uh who are who are catholic or at least christian who begin to say well you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna make some movie Hmm. And I don't care how it gets out there. I don't care what the distribution is. I don't even care if I make a whole lot of money off of it. Uh, I want it to be there. Yeah. I want it to yeah. be in the in the mainstream so that whoever sees it can see it. And then if Hollywood wants to pick it up and put it on the big screen, that's fine. I mean, that's part of what Catholic Underground does. We we we're, we're not charging it for it. We just know that it's got to get out there. 
and you need to hear about it. You know, and I wonder if, Father, that's not the way to that kind of halcyon day of, of, the, of the priest being painted in a good light is, is very much this, the democratization of content. I think it's definitely a feasible way to that, for sure. Yeah. You know, I've been reading a, a good book on screenwriting called Save the Cat, um, and I believe the subtitle is The Last Book on Screenwriting You'll Ever Read. And uh, the author, Blake Snyder, says that there are so many unnecessary sequels because the elevator pitch gets the money folks behind it. And so if that similar pitch for the film did well uh, at the box office, then chances are if I just pitch to you the same characters in a, in a funny way in a, for a sequel, it's going to make money. And I, I think that maybe uh, the demand for faith-based based films it could be a real thing in Hollywood, or it could be a follow-the-money thing. And that's where I kind of go, okay, well, maybe that's why we're starting to twist and distort what the truth is or what will, make a, will, what will put more people in the seats, you know, what will sell more popcorn. Yeah. And, and I think that's the slippery slope, is that once Hollywood becomes a magisterium in and of itself, that's where we could be uh, kind of in a place of danger. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's, I think Hollywood really is, uh, I don't know, Father, a secular magisterium. Oh, it definitely is. There's no doubt whatsoever. There's a philosophy, there's a priesthood. It's all built in. Yeah, exactly. Man. Uh-huh. And there's even the Motion Picture Association of America, which is its code of canon law. Evil. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you see what I did there? I love it. Yeah, this has been rated PG-13. So uh, now moving from the film industry to using technology in a way uh, that I would love to see the film industry go, uh, a Texas Aggie Catholic has created a Google map mashup with the locations of the deaths of the 12 apostles. And this is, it's, it's actually totally awesome. Uh, if uh, you, you know how, Jeff, you use Google Maps to, uh, to, to get directions to this or that or, mm-hmm. or to get to your local pizza establishment, well, well, this guy um, actually took a, a Google Map interface, and he dropped a lot of pins, you see. Yes. In fact, we'll bring that up on three uh, for those of you watching in the video feed. And he put on the pins, if you click, he has a little history of, uh, of what happened in this particular locale. So, for example, St. Peter was killed in Rome during Nero's persecutions. He was crucified upside down per request, so as not to have his own crucifixion be like Jesus. And you can actually zoom down and see where that was in Rome. So he's actually used Google Maps to show the the death uh, the death place and, or the disputed death place of all 12 apostles because as you know, father with the exception of John, uh, all of the uh, all of the 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 12 died gruesome death by martyrdom. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, and St. John of course died in in Ephesus and uh, he lived his last years in exile there. And uh, it is purported that the Blessed Mother at some point passed that way. Right. I mean, th- there's actually that beautiful, uh, that beautiful story of, um, uh, in Father Elijah, which yeah. is, is fictional, but gorgeous all the same. That's right. You know, in, it's in fact, kind of different, different moments. And, of course, this Google map makes it so incredibly real because you realize how far away yeah. you know, people like Thomas went. And you go, man, yeah. That's, yeah. that's a long way. And the fact that, like, St. Simon the Zealot, who, uh, who was sawed in half— uh, that was done in present day Iran. I mean, all of these places that are that are in, in a great deal of turmoil today. Right. They were evangelized long before they were Islamic countries. You know. Yeah, but one of the points that uh, is made in, uh, with the uh, the article that goes along with this is that um, uh, this. I guess I don't know what kind of research it took to determine mm-hmm. if this is in fact what happened, but. It points out that um, all traces of Christianity were basically just uh, kind of done away with uh, after the the uh, their deaths, uh, mm-hmm. because that's that was uh, was it Muslims uh, that um, well the the rise of Islam had a lot to do with okay. that because you know today uh, in present day Turkey in Syria in Iran in Iraq there are still very large Christian well I say large there are very present ki- Christian communities mm-hmm. Catholic communities. Oh. Uh, and so the the churches that were, I believe, the 2014 word is planted, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> okay. The the churches that 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 uh, the the original dioceses that these these apostles yeah. founded, we we would call them that today. They're still around in in some way or another. Um, but there was just this this wave of Islam that swept over swept over many of these countries. And so the the notion is to because 
being a Christian, you're an infidel, that has to be completely eradicated. And so you have things like the Hagia Sophia, that great Christian church of Byzantium, being converted into a mosque. Mm -hmm. You have all these other things happening elsewhere. And so it's not that the church is... Um, just simply fizzled out because the gospel wasn't real, but they were overtaken. But in this timeline of history, uh, yeah. when did that actually, when did their, their deaths, their martyrdom occur? Uh, uh, very early on. I yeah, mean, uh, yeah. you know, in, in fact, um, Father Ryan can correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things that, that we as Catholics believe is, is that uh, the, the, the deposit of faith was, was sealed, if you will, with the death of the last apostle. And that was well before Father, if I'm not mistaken, well before 100 AD. Wow. Well, well a subtle adjustment that that the, the the tradition of the church continues to yes, develop. Correct. But but in terms of new revelation. That's right. Yeah, that 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 closes. Huh. Um and, and that's with the death of the apostle, Saint John the Apostle. Yeah. Right. Who uh, who was the one who died peacefully? Uh, and these were all, like I say, before. 100, I do believe. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the general idea is that Don, John uh, did the book of Revelation around 90 A.D. and then dies comfortably between 92 and 94 A.D. is what we were taught in seminary. Yeah. Mm, okay. Still, great use of Google Maps huh, to uh, to learn a little bit about our um, our Christian yeah, heritage. Yeah, and, and this, is exactly, this is exactly the kind of thing that we're all about. And very quickly, before we go to, uh, to our picks of the week, uh, Ignatius Press, in case you were wondering, announces video streaming. Uh, Ignatius Press, of course, one of the best Catholic publishers in the world. Uh, anytime I see Ignatius on the spine of a book, mm -hmm. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to buy it. Yeah. Uh, they've branched out into video streaming. They have about 100 video titles, uh, ranging from 2 to $5 per viewing. And uh, I'm really excited about this because there are a lot of religious films that uh, they're, they're either very expensive to own on DVD mm -hmm. or perhaps they're unavailable in some markets. Yeah, including and, feature films. These are very, yeah, very well made. Yeah, they're well made. They're yes. very well made. And, and uh, not, it's not just kind of the cheesy ones, yeah. but, but some very, very well made ones. I'm thinking, of course, of uh, John Paul II's uh, film by John Voight, where John mm -hmm. Voight plays the Pope. That was a really good film. Mm. It was well done. Yeah. Uh, Father Ryan, I'm excited about this. It's a very, very cool thing. I mean, I don't know exactly who the audience is. Yeah. Um, because younger people, I think, are going to have a harder time with the idea of watching an entire thing on my computer because I don't think they really support devices very well. Yeah. But, you know, it's a start, and it's a it good is. start. And, and the fact that a Catholic entity is doing it. However, yeah. let me just toss this out here, Father Ryan, um, yeah. because we uh, had uh, um, one of their spokespeople, the marketing people, on just about a week ago on the radio and did an interview. Yeah. And uh, they're looking into a Roku app oh, for Ignatius. Well. So, uh, well, there you go. It's all it, it's all in the programming, right? It's all in the build and, and how mm -hmm. easy this thing is to use. Right, that's uh, it. Because a lot of folks, I mean, you say the, the young, the young are using uh, the streaming technologies, but... A lot of uh, a lot of the the mid to older folks are are learning the uh, the values of binge watching when they have nothing else to do, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know. So, uh, so I think it could go somewhere. I, I don't know. Too. I'm I'm excited about it because uh, whereas I might not buy a DVD mm -hmm. of a particular religious film, I'll pay two to five bucks to stream it and really see if it's something that I like or if it's something I want to present to my parish. There you go. And then I'll buy the DVD. So uh, it, it could be a good way to, to make things happen. Uh, Kathleen, would you stream some of these videos? Yeah, absolutely, especially being a teacher. Um, oh, yeah, that's right, because you all can yeah. stream in the classroom. Yeah, and, you know, it's, yeah, to, to buy a DVD, especially if you don't have... Especially if you're a teacher. Especially if you're a teacher, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and most of the DVDs that we buy as a department, I always want to keep, so... Yeah, yeah, Jeff. Father Chris, I was going to ask you. Uh huh. What what time is it over there? I believe it's time for the CU pick of the week. I went a little far of the field, but uh, <laughs> far field, but that's okay. I love talking about technology, as yeah. you can tell. Uh, for our first pick of the week, uh, why don't we throw it over to uh, to Kathleen? Okay, so yeah. I have used um, a book by Brandon Vaught before. Mm hmm. Um. It was The Church and New Media. Correct. This week, I have a new one. Yeah. Looky here. We actually have a still of it, so you don't have to hold it oh. up to oh. the screen. So if you're on the video feed, what's the name of the book for our radio well, listeners? Shoot. <laughs> I, was, I was just getting there, but it's Saints and Social Justice, A Guide to Changing the World by Brandon Vaught. Yeah. It, um, it takes the seven principles of social teaching. Catholic social teaching. Catholic social teaching. Yeah. And it goes. Um, it, it has some reflections by uh, Brandon, and mm -hmm. then what certain saints have to say about it or experiences or stories from them. And so it includes um, people like Blessed Mother Teresa, uh, yeah. Blessed Giorgio Frassati, 
uh, St. Thomas More, St. Peter Claver, and of course, um, St. John Paul II. That's right. Just to name a few, but it has about two two or three for each, um, and it's, it's really good. Yeah, I've, I've I th- read the first one. I think sometimes we tend to think of, uh, of social justice and kind of this ethereal, yeah. it just means that I'm going to go and, and uh, serve at the, the food kitchen, the, the soup kitchen or something. Right. There's so much more to Catholic social teaching than just kind of this this vague horizontal outreach. Right. And um, and I would imagine that Brandon does a really good job of of, uh, of showing how that's yeah. that's very true because all of these uh, all of these blesseds and saints, they had uh, a very significant devotion to Christ through His Church through the liturgy, and it was that that led them out into the world to say, now how can I take what I have received here in the Mass and 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 push into the community right. and and extend the hands and feet of Christ. So. Uh, so it could be a, a very good read. I haven't read it yet. I've seen it. It's been out. Uh, for I a just while. got it, so I'm I'm just. And I would it. imagine that this may make its way into your curriculum as campus minister. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> very cool. All righty. Well, uh, that's that's a that's a good pick of the week. Thanks. I fully support it. Uh, um, Father Ryan, would you like to give us your pick of the week? I'd be so excited I could hardly stand it. <laughs> there is a service, uh, or rather, I should say that one of the things that that is so cool about right now is that. TV is cheap. You can buy a, a big TV fairly cheaply. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm doing at my school was installing a big TV as bulletin boards. Yep. But then I got to find something to drive, some kind of software that can make that work. And so I'm going to be using Raspberry Pis. And I was we, we had talked, of course, Father, about a service um, that I think was called Ovation maybe or something like yeah, that. Uh, um, uh, it's always, yeah. Keep going. It's something like that. Anyway, so it, but, it, but it, there, there are all kinds of quirks. Well, there's a new service out there that is very, very free uh, that has some extremely cool features called Rise Vision. Um, I don't know how they're going to continue doing it free, but they've got all these really cool features they're working on. And heck, I'd pay for it, but it's a really interesting thing. And so if you're someone who needs to create um, uh, kiosks, even if you're just a small business owner and you've got an extra computer monitor, this is a great way to look really professional uh, to put this in your in your sitting room, your waiting room, if you're a doctor, a lawyer, a veterinarian, uh, and you can put simple little notations. You can run videos. You can run YouTube videos. It's extremely cool. Uh, it's very, very free. It's called Rise Vision, R-I-S-E-V-I-S-I-O-N. It's in the show notes. Um, and if you if you have a good experience with it, uh, email us at backchat at com and tell me how it is because I'm about to implement it at yeah. my school. And and I'll I'll see what I can do with it once you implement it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll come and take a tour. We want to report. Father. That's right. Cuz cuz I'm thinking about uh about the the new Catholic Underground Studios that are that are coming up hopefully uh in in a little while and and how some of this stuff can play with that. So, very very cool. Uh and then uh, Jeff, you've got a pick of the week now. Yeah, I'm so happy. <laughs> um actually Amazon Music and they've been working on this for the last couple of weeks. I've been noticing some changes. Um and I've been a Prime member for the last uh, 4 or 5 years, I guess. Um and I, I really like the their their service and you know shopping is so easy all that stuff. But I, I years ago I kind of got frustrated. I was downloading music from iTunes. It's so proprietary. You can't burn CDs, you can't share it. I want to use it as a ringtone, you know, it's just like blah blah blah, all mm-hmm. this legally stuff. Well, anyway, uh, Walmart Music came out, and they came on strong at first. Well, they're out of business now, but Amazon is just kind of uh, adding to it little by little. Yeah. And with their uh, cloud service, you can uh, take your music with you, but share it between devices. You can uh, you can actually rip your own CDs and put them on the cloud for listening to later on. Uh, as a Prime member, you get all kinds of uh, free music to download uh, and just, now, can and, you just stream it, or can you download it as well? Well, I, you know what, um, it's probably streaming. No, but. Uh, well, streaming. At, what uh, there is, there was a tab, and I, and I, uh, I want to oh. say download. Yeah, okay. because I, I did that just yesterday. So or offline uh, listening, I'd imagine. Uh, right. Probably yeah. so. Very cool. But, uh, but anyway, I just, I just like the the flexibility of it. And uh, it's it's not expensive. It's kind of like the going rate for the same music that you would pay for on iTunes, but yeah. you could do a lot more with it on Amazon. So um, I'm a fan. Father Ryan, do you have uh, have you looked into Prime Music at all? I used it. I've used all the services off and on. I've used Google Music. I've used Prime Music. Um, it, it it works well enough. The thing is, the catalogs of these free services are yeah. never what you want. Yeah. And and so I've stuck with Spotify because if there's a new artist out there doing something interesting, yeah, I know I can get to it. I don't want to be in my car and say I really want to listen to this song. Right. You know, and then 
can't find it on Google Play, can't find it on Amazon Prime, and then yeah. I've got to go spend 99 cents or $3 on a right. song. You know, yeah, and then spend six years downloading it up, up in uh, <laughs> yes. non-LTE category, uh, territory. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, my pick of the week is actually a podcast. Uh, as you know, I do like listening to podcasts when I have a chance, and I also like listening to the BBC World Service. Well, uh, to commemorate 100 years of the beginning of the First World War, BBC is doing a podcast series on World War I, um, and they actually are going all around uh, to their regional radio stations as well as the BBC, uh, the, the kind of the, the mothership network, and they're doing all these different aspects of the war. And it's really, really interesting stuff. And so they've been, uh, they've been playing these on the World Service, but um, they go from um, composers and the legacy of World War I in music. They talk about um, the sequence of events that lead up to World War I. They talk about... Um, being French in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, they talk about uh, how Berlin uh, itself experienced the, the rush up to uh, Der Tag, to the, the day, the war. And they're going all over using some of their BBC regional services to, to look at World War I and the march up to World War I from all of these different uh, perspectives. And so all of these are available indefinitely, uh, according to the BBC's website, um, for uh, for subscription and for listening and streaming uh, via podcast. So we'll put that in the show notes. It's BBC's World War One series uh, over uh, on iTunes or or Zoom. Actually, you can you can still subscribe on a Zoom if you. Good have Lord! I know <laughs> that either makes them really really edgy or really really outdated on their uh, podcasting page. But yeah, there you go. So uh, so that's that's our picks of the week. Let us know what your picks of the week are. At catholicunderground.com, you can uh, comment or you can send it to us back chat at catholicunderground.com. Jeff, we thank those who help us, don't we? Indeed we do. Portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground. That's audibletrial.com slash catholicunderground. That's right. Yes, if you like what you hear, if you like what you watch then uh, please go to catholicunderground.com and consider becoming one of our undergrounders. Consider subscribing to our content uh, by way of, uh, of, a, of a donation, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, we certainly make good use of it. In fact, Jeff has his own light now for the TV uh, broadcast. He actually is lit. You Thanks know? to uh, you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, if you want to do that, catholicunderground.com is the place to go. Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org and he is at FR Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan, for joining us. It has been my pleasure. Jeff Blackwell is the tech director for the CU. He is the ruling despot at the Blackwell Communications Group. We love him. Jeff Blackwell.us and on Twitter at Jeff Blackwellis. Thank you, Jeff. It's an honor, Father. Also, Kathleen Lee is our faith ninja. She's at Kathleen Y-A-B-R on Twitter if she checks it ever. I do. Oh, thank you, Kathleen. <laughs> Anytime. And Ed Ball is on the, well, ball with our video feed this week. Uh, and you know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic is the way to do it. You can join us on the interwebs at catholicunderground.tv for even more from the CU. Thank you for tuning in and hanging out with us on the digital continent. We are Catholic Underground. We are Faith Gone Digital. And we will see you next time. Catholic Underground.